So sure enough, he's on at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. But the synopsis of both of my talks got merged into the synopsis for this talk. <laughs> so if you actually read it, you'd say, now this doesn't make sense. It's kind of like you know, talking about uh, you know, chocolate and dill pickles in the same recipe. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, Vista on Linux, which is a, a complete uh, free and open source stack for electronic health records. And I'm not going to say anything about Go. Out of curiosity, how many people here get uh, health care from the VA? OK. Great. So you'll, if you've had health care in the VA, part of your medical records at the VA are actually in a, in a VISTA system. And if, as part of your service, you ever got health care in the Department of Defense, that also is in a, in a variant of the, the VISTA system. Again, thank you for your service. So this is just the obligatory marketing slide. I work for a company called YoddaDB, and um, we're basically a high-performance, open-source, NoSQL database engine. And it's used in very large, the code base under a different brand name is used in some very large banking systems. It's also used in very large electronic health record systems. And um, we're basically taking it to other markets and applications. And it runs on all the way from a Raspberry Pi up to a very high-end nation-scale system. And because of the nature of the applications we run on, our tagline is basically rock solid, lightning fast, secure, pick any tree. OK, so who knows this place? That's why I asked about anyone from North Carolina. <laughs> OK, you're from North Carolina. Where is this place, sir? I don't know that. OK, so it's, there's a, this is Central Regional Hospital from a town called Butner, North Carolina. It's about a half hour north of Raleigh. And it is a facility of the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services. It is a, um, a mental health inpatient hospital. And this means that patients are often there for many years, in some cases still for the rest of their lives. And, uh, and again, it's operated by the, the state of North Carolina. So they implemented a complete open source stack of Vista on Linux. And they saved the North Carolina taxpayers millions of dollars. Perhaps tens of millions. Again, I don't know the, the exact prices that people actually pay for these systems. But they took the open source stack. They implemented it themselves. And uh, the result was that North Carolina taxpayers are now millions of dollars better off than they would have been otherwise. Now, of course, part of the challenge in all of this is that it's very hard to show money saved. It's easy to show money spent. It's you know just like in, in healthcare. It's very easy to show that you spent money in caring for someone with measles. You don't really talk so much about you know, preventing it by immunization. So immunizations get the, the short end of the stick. OK, so let me talk a little bit about what is Vista. So it's de developed by the Department of Veterans Affairs. I'll talk a little bit in, in a few minutes about the history. And it's used throughout the VA system. And it's a, it's a healthcare information system. So it's not just for clinical applications. It doesn't just keep track of all of your, your clinical care. But it also does inventory management. It does scheduling. It does many things. And there's actually a book called The Best Care Anywhere by Philip Longman. And the interesting story is he actually was commissioned by the, so way back when, if you remember, there was a movie born on the 4th of July by, um, yeah, I forget who it was, but they had this movie and it you know, sort of depicted the VA as sort of being the dirty place and, and so on. So the, the author was actually commissioned by either Forbes or Fortune to write an article about how bad things were at the VA. He went and did his research, came back and told them, you don't really have a story unless you want a story on how good things are about the VA. 
So they paid him as retainer and let him go because it was not news to write about things that are going well. So he wrote a book instead. And, uh, and the book argues that essentially the best care in the United States is actually delivered by the VA system. Now, you know, you've probably seen the news about facilities in Phoenix and elsewhere where patients died because they couldn't get scheduled in time. That was sort of very much of a, of a local issue where they had the wrong incentives in place in some cases for managers to show, you know, short, short waiting times and so on. But if you look overall at the statistics, veterans as a population are sicker than the population as a whole because you're entitled to care from the VA for service-related conditions, right? So if you, so therefore, they have pe people who have, you know, Agent Orange, Agent Orange causes cancer. They've had people who have, you know, PTSD, all kinds of symptoms like that that they treat. So the people they treat are actually sicker than the population as a whole, but their costs have actually been going up less than the population as a whole. And if you look at a number of metrics they, they actually have better metrics and better outcomes than the commercial healthcare system. And so that's what the book is about. So it's definitely well worth a read. It's a few years old now. I would say I think it's probably the latest edition was maybe five or six years old, but it's definitely worth uh, taking a look. Now the same system is used not just in the Department of Veterans Affairs, but also in other branches of the federal government. So the Department of Defense uses it. There's a, um, a system called CHCS, which they deployed in the 1990s. And they're trying hard to replace it. So here's the sad story about CHCS. The Department of Defense obviously has got healthcare needs that the VA doesn't have. So the Department of Defense has, they've got to do pediatrics. Right, because if you're a, a service member serving on a base, you have kids, they provide care. The Department of Defense needs OB-GYN, right? So there are no pediatric veterans. Until recently, I guess pregnancy was not really a cause of a, a service-related condition because back in the day, pretty much all veterans were male. So. Well, th things have changed now, but I'm talking about the mid-1990s. Okay. And so the Department of Defense had a few requirements that were not part of the VA system. They could have had the VA system for free, and for a small investment in programming, they could have programmed the additional functionality that was needed. Well, what happened was they did it in the typical Department of Defense style. They put out a procurement contract. They actually had three people, so they had this uh, bake-off between three vendors to see who could provide the, you know, the best solution at the lowest price. Well, there were three vendors. One of them happened to be a, um, a company that was then called SAIC. I don't know what their name is today. So they actually took Vista from the VA under the Freedom of Information Act. So under the Freedom of Information Act, you can get Vista. So they got Vista under the Freedom of Information Act. They added some functionality for the Bake Off. And at about 30% of the cost of the next bidder, they demonstrated something like 90% of the required functionality. So naturally, they got the contract, and which was, you know, made sense in a, in a certain twisted way. And so for tens of millions of dollars, they sold the system to the Department of Defense. The same system implemented in the Department of Defense is a proprietary system, not an open source system. But there you go, that's how you know, people in DOD, their electronic health records are in a variant of VISTA. There's VISTA in the VA. The people in the Indian Health Service, which is part of the Department of Health and Human Services, they did it the right way. They took VISTA from the VA under the Freedom of Information Act. And again, they had some unique requirements that the VA didn't have. For example, many of the Let's say the, the Indian nations and reservations and locations are remote. You literally don't have any net, didn't have any networking, so they had to run the system on a PC rather than in a central network facility. They also needed things like pediatric growth charts and all of the things that um, you know, pediatrics needs. So they took 
the Freedom of Information Act VISTA, they added to it and they deployed it. Now, their system is not 100% compatible with VISTA, but they kind of knew what they were doing because they said, here are the places where we need to make changes. But they did it the right way compared to the Department of Defense. It's also been adopted in a number of states. So for example, I talked about North Carolina. So they did it the right way by using a, a free and open source stack. There are others like New York and Tennessee, the State of Mental Health in New York, State of Mental Health, the Depart sorry, Department of Mental Health in New York, Department of Mental Health in Tennessee, the Oklahoma State um, Veterans Homes. So they all run variants of VISTA. Except for North Carolina, the others are actually deploying VISTA, even though VISTA they're using as the free and open source, free, the, sorry, FOIA VISTA, which is in the public domain. They're actually deploying it on a proprietary stack. Whereas North Carolina has actually deployed it on, a, on an open source stack. And we have hospitals and clinics in the United States outside of the government system that have deployed it. So the most notable example is um, Oroville Hospital in uh, Northern California. So last year, that part of California was in the news for all of the wildfires. They didn't actually get to Oroville, but there were other parts that, uh, and, and by the way, if you ever get to visit, it's the site of the tallest earthworks dam in the United States. So there's this huge dam. You go on one side, you see deer grazing on the side. It just looks like the side of a hill, but it's actually a dam with a lake behind it. So, so they deployed, they took Vista from the VA. They deployed it, and they're deploying it in an open source stack. And by the way, it's deployable also at the level of the family physician, although that requires some expertise that most family physicians don't have. I mean, I would rather probably have my physician focusing on healthcare rather than focusing on, you know, implementing yeah, computer systems. <laughs> well, so, so in this case, it turns out that this is a, a physician who he and his wife have a practice in rural Tennessee. His background is electrical engineering and you know, he always enjoys programming. So I guess he worked out a deal with his wife where I think she sees patients most of the time. He sees patients part-time and maintains the system part-time and he also does some consulting. So it's, it's possible. So. And actually internationally, it's used in a number of countries. The most noteworthy is Jordan. So in Jordan, they actually have, you know, so to put things in perspective, Jordan is about the area and population of Indiana or Tennessee or Kentucky. They have three healthcare systems. That's sort of a fourth one, but they have three healthcare systems. So one is the Ministry of Health System. So most Jordanians who are not members of the services get their care in the Ministry of Health System. They have the Royal Medical Services, which are primarily for the, the military health system. And then they have the, the private uh, healthcare system. And then the, the fourth one is they have a system for the Royal High Court for the Royal Family, and that's a, a very small system, but that's completely separate from anything else. So they've actually taken VISTA from the Department of Veterans Affairs. They're de deploying it on an open source stack. They actually have a, so they have one system for, for the Ministry of Health, another system for the Royal Medical Services. And they don't use the same database because they are concerned about the Royal Medical Services, obviously more concerned about things like security and so on. But they actually are deploying it and they're actually getting benefits from, which the VA also gets by the way. So the VA can, because of the fact that they have all of these medical records, they can now look at it and say, if I have a patient with condition X, let's say, you know, I, I guess uh, excessive cholesterol, what's the best statin to start this patient on? And they can do these kinds of uh, analytics because they have this huge database. And they can say, if this patient is male and Caucasian, well, this is the statin we want to start on. If it happens to be female and African-American, this is the statin we want to start on, you know, if it's Asian-American. So they can do all of this kind of, of analysis and they can do this based on outcomes and cost. Well, the Jordanians are getting the benefit of all of, all of that. And and then it's been deployed in um, some sites in India as well, including one hospital, which is the first in Asia 
to be certified at the HEMS analytics level six. So HEMS is the Healthcare Information Management Society, and they have these levels of analytics. So level seven is the highest. So the first hospital in Asia to be, so the first in India, second in Asia, to be certified at level six actually just took VISTA and, and deployed it. So again, all of this, the, the VISTA is completely free for the downloading. And again, there are some choices to be made as to which variant of VISTA you want, and, and you, you can talk to me about that offline or ask questions, but, but they're basically using free software, deploying it on an open source stack, and getting all of the benefits of doing that. So the, the origins of VISTA actually go back to the late 1970s. And so back in the 1970s, you know, computers were coming out, many computers, and you had all of these islands of automation. So you had different VA hospitals and, and systems, and they each had different you know, priorities. So maybe one decided to do mental health first, another one decided to do you know, cardiology first, whatever. So they started doing the, you know, implementing software. And the key thing about this was that in all of these cases, they had programmers and caregivers literally sitting side by side. The caregiver would say, this is kind of what I want. The programmer would go off and program it, come back there, you know, two hours later or the next day and kind of say, is this kind of what you had in mind? So essentially the system was developed by the user and the, the programmer working in close collaboration. And then they started hearing about efforts in one, you know, and then they started uh, pooling their resources and, and doing their work. Well, at this point, so when I say the birth through the adversity, the VA acquired a, a central information office. So they said, we are the people in the ivory tower who develop all IT <laughs> systems. You will not develop it out in the hospitals. So there was this incredible period of several years where, you know, the, so there, there are lots of stories. So there's one guy who went out to lunch. When he came back, his computer had been created and shipped off elsewhere. As far as we know, that computer was never used anywhere else. There was a, another guy who was fired and blacklisted. They found out that he was, you know, so, so programmers out in the hospitals were forbidden from, from developing electronic health record systems. He was fired. He eventually, I think, worked as a bus driver until he, he died, a school bus driver, and, and did other careers, but he never went back to work um, on the system. There's supposedly one case where when a guy was away, when he came back, the computer had been taken out to the parking lot and set on fire. Um, so, you know, so, and, 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 of course, people are resourceful. People in the, in the hospitals developed ways. So at that time, purchasing a mini computer was forbidden. Purchasing a word processor was permitted. So a lot of the hospitals purchased word processors. And then the word processors did magical things, not just processing words. So anyway, so all of that was documented in that, uh, in that uh, first link. And eventually what happened was that um, these people got together. There was a congressional committee that got wind of this. And they set up a mini computer in a hotel suite in Washington, DC, and actually invited the staffer, one of the staffers, to come see the thing. He came and saw it, and that staffer eventually went on to become, when he was Chuck Hagel, who went on to become a senator from Nebraska. But he saw this, and he went back and said, hey, this thing really works. This thing really solves the problem. The Central Information Office has not solved the problem yet. So that basically, VISTA became legal at that point and became the official way of doing things. And of course, the Central Information Office said, yes, this is kind of what we had in mind all along. And then um, the Indian Health Service adopted it in the 1980s. And again, that is documented that, again, there was a process by which it was accepted. It wasn't as if someone just got up one morning and said, hey, I want VISTA. But, um, you know, but they did that uh, in a reasonable fashion. And, uh, and then I talked about how it was sold to the Department of Defense in the 1990s. And then since then, there have been a number of both successful and failed implementations 
in many locations around the world. So back in the 1990s, the, the D State Department, as part of foreign aid efforts, said, hey, Egypt wants a, has a cancer institute. Let's give them VISTA as part of our foreign aid. So they went in, they set up the system, eventually that failed, and there are failed implementations in, in Pakistan and a number of other countries like that. Just as there are successful implementations both here and abroad. And I, I'll talk a little bit about the, the successes and failures. Now I said the slide was, the his, was history, a little bit of future history. One of the unfortunate things that's happening right now is that over the last so many years, funding for VISTA development at the VA has been starved because there's a lot of politics and now the VA is supposedly deploying a commercial system called Cerner, which they think is gonna solve, magically solve a lot of their things. So the cost of that, when we last heard before they'd even implemented any software was $10 billion. The latest is $16 billion. And I'm sure by the time it's ever deployed, if it's ever deployed successfully, it's gonna be a lot more than that. When by hiring, I mean, let's say you hired 20, 30 programmers and let's say each programmer cost hundred thousand, two hundred thousand dollars, that's still gonna be a lot less than the cost of a commercial Cerner system to, to bring the system back on track. But this is the you know the the dysfunctional environment that we live in. And I just leave that to you as something to think about. I don't have any answers for that. I can just see what's happening. Sorry? Right, no, yeah. Ab uh, absolutely. You keep, I, I have a question, I hope you don't mind it. You keep saying Yada VV, I thought it was MUMPS. Well, MUMPS is a language. It's a database. Yeah, and a database. And the core, in fact, I'll, I'll talk about, why don't you hold that question for a, a few minutes? So we'll talk about the technology stack. So the application code is actually written in, in M or MUMPS. So MUMPS stands for Massachusetts General Hospital Utility Multiprogramming System. And if you can say that in one breath, you're a better person than I am. <laughs> but uh, you know, in the healthcare world, that's an inside joke. But it was standardized as M by ANSI and by the ISO. So there's a standard for M. It's now mostly a dormant standard for, for various commercial reasons. But VISTA is written in M. And uh, Vista, again, it's a, it's a t the back end is terminal based. It's roll and scroll with some screen oriented capabilities. And then it's got messaging and web services and remote procedure calls for implementing a variety of front ends. So the, it'll run on any standard M and the VA actually uses a proprietary M implementation YaraDB happens to be an implementation of M. So, so our, what we did is we took an open source implementation of M, which I happened to manage at a Fortune 500 company for over 20 years. And then we started YaraDB a couple of years ago. So M was successful because there's a tight marriage between a programming language and a database. And what we said is there's no reason for the language and the database to be so tightly bound. So what we did is we created a tight binding from C to the database. So now YaraDB, you can, you know, if you're programming in M, if you're using Vista, you can use YaraDB as an implementation of M or MUMPS. If you're writing in some other uh, language, C, or we're working on Go and Rust, and eventually there'll be Python and Java and other languages as well. So we have tight bindings to the database from these other languages. So you don't need to use M to access the M database, which is just a, a hierarchical, hierarchical key value database. So that's where YaraDB comes in. And so did that answer the question? And, uh, and of course, the, the open source operating system is, uh, is Linux. Now the front end, was that a question there? No. Sorry, I thought I sneaky. So the front end, the traditional front end that the VA uses is actually a, um, a thick client. It's written in Delphi, which is an implementation of Borland from, uh, implementation of Pascal from Borland. Um, and, and again, the, the source code for this is, is open source. It runs on Windows. 
and, and it um, runs on Wine if you want to run it on, on Linux. And then because of the fact that the, the back end has got, uh, so, uh, uh, so the CPRS GUI uses remote procedure calls to communicate with the back end. Those RPCs are usable, so if you wanted to create another front end with a different um, look and feel, you can do that. Um, there are um, thin clients that use it. There's a, a standard called Fire, F-H-I-R is how it's spelled. So there are Fire clients that use messaging messaging interfaces to, to interface with Vista. And what Oroville Hospital has done is Oroville is actually 60 miles north of Sacramento. Many of the physicians live in Sacramento. They actually put on a bus with a secured cellular access and they gave the physicians iPads. So essentially what the physicians do while well, they're commuting on this bus from Sacramento to Oroville, they're actually checking out the status of all their patients at the hospital and everything they need to do. So when they actually arrive at the hospital in the bus, they, uh, they know what, what's, what's ahead of what they need to do. So again, the back end is long lived, it's in bumps, but obviously the, the front end, there are any number of front ends and you can create front end technologies um, as, as you need to. Now, by the way, don't get me wrong, creating a front end is not a matter of you know, setting up a weekend hackathon and then coming up with a, with a front end because healthcare is one of the most complicated things that we do. And if you want to create a front end that is a comprehensive front end for providing healthcare, there does need to be a lot of design in it. So it's not a matter of, it's not like falling off a log. So the, the ecosystem, healthcare has a, you know, a healthcare information system is just part of a complete healthcare ecosystem. So if you're providing healthcare, you need a lot of interfaces to things like imaging. Right, your healthcare information system is not your imaging system. There are actually Vista-based imaging system. Vista imaging is a thing, but it requires expertise to install and run, and I don't know if it's completely available in an open source stack. If you want analytics, well, that again, there are FOS and open source solutions for analytics, but you'll have to implement them. You don't, they don't come canned. Vista essentially you get the the whole thing. Um, drug interaction databases, again, in the US that comes from a proprietary source. The VA actually used to have their own, but they gave up and they're actually getting that from a proprietary vendor. Now it turns out that there are actually open source drug interaction databases. There's one from the World Health Organization and there's one that is actually made available by the French government which has been translated into, into English. What I don't know, and again, I'm not a, I'm not a clinician, I don't, I'm, a, I'm a geek, so I don't know whether, for example, the World Health Organization Interaction Database or the, the French database are legal to use in the US from a government regulation point of view. I know they're available. And similarly, things like diagnostic codes, you know, if you go to, to the doctor, and the doctor orders a test. There are diagnostic codes written out there. Well, it turns out those diagnostic codes are proprietary. And they're owned by the American Medical Association. So there are, there are things out there that you know, are, are free and open source, and there are things out there that are proprietary, and there are things that well, there are alternatives. And of course, the whole thing that's left open out here is, is billing. In the US, there are two completely disjointed sets of health of IT when it comes to healthcare, there's the clinical side and then there's the, the health the payer side, and um, and they send each other messages back and forth. And the payer side is pretty much at this point um, mostly proprietary, but and and again it varies from state to state and sometimes even different cities within the state. Okay, so if you want to do a, a Vista implementation, so just based on looking at all of the implementations that have succeeded, what are some of the things that make them succeed? So the first thing is that, you know, with great power comes responsibility. How many people out here have seen the, you know, the magician's assistant in Fantasia? Okay, so there are Vista implementations that make you 
think of that and you know and and there are some people that think that installing Vista is like installing a, an office suite. And to some extent, that's right. So literally, you can get a Docker container and spin it up, and it's running Vista. Back in you know, 10, 15 years ago, I actually came up with things where with live CDs, Linux live CDs, when they were a thing, you could actually boot one up and run Vista. I've created virtual machines with Vista. So, so installing Vista is actually trivial. But just because you've installed Vista doesn't mean that you can now provide care for a patient. Because if you want to provide care for a patient, you need to have your patient, you know, who's the provider? That needs to be registered. If you're providing a test result, you need to know what machine did the test, which lab did the test. So before you can actually provide your first patient data and record an encounter, there's all of this setup that has to be done. And there's all of this setup that has to be maintained. And providing healthcare literally is one of the most, I mean, set aside the, the payer part of it. Just on the clinical side, it's one of the most complicated endeavors that, that we go through. And I've heard people then complaining about the complexity of the software. Well, the fact is you have to accept that for any information technology, the complexity of the software has to match the complexity of the activity that it's supposed to, to automate. And so one of the ingredients of success is recognizing that this is a you know, journey, not a destination, that there's going to be complexity, and you have, to be, you have to be prepared to deal with complexity. And the complexity of the programming language and the application, some of it is historical, I agree. But a large part of it is because you're implementing software that now must match the business logic, workflows, and business practices of a very complicated enterprise. And even if you're providing healthcare at the, at the primary care level, that's still a very complicated activity. And if you're doing that at the level of a secondary or a tertiary hospital, that's you know, substantially more complicated. So the complication in implementing Vista matches the complication of your enterprise. The other thing is, you know, open source actually empowers users. It, it shifts the balance of power from the provider to the user. Okay? And what this means is that you need to have, as a user, th with the power leading to responsi and responsibility going hand in hand, you need to take responsibility for making sure that you have expertise. Now, the expertise doesn't mean that you have to have an employee. It could be a contractor, but it means you must have the expertise available. It's not just that there is some, you know, fast vendor where you can open a support ticket. You need to actually know what's going on. So, so this is where the, the mag magician's expertise comes in, assistant's expertise comes in, because if you're running a fast system, in theory, if you have enough money, and again, that's, that's the big if there, you pay someone, they take care of it. Whereas here, you really need to know what you're doing. Another part is, you know, again, implementing something like Vista is a journey. And so the ones that I've seen that are successful start small. <coughs> so for example, at, uh, at Central Regional Hospital, they started with some functionality for one ward and then gradually expanded the functionality to other wards. <coughs> what they did in Jordan was they did a pilot. They actually hired um, a, a company that had Vista expertise to come in and do a pilot, and when they did the pilot, they were watching and they learned, and then they took over. And then after the pilot was completed, they say they actually formed a nonprofit company, and that nonprofit company, which is owned by the board of directors from the hospitals and the Ministry of Health, they actually then are rolling it out to the, the rest of the, the country. So it's, a, it's an expansion. You know, but you start small and you expand. Another part of it is that you have to plan for change. Okay, a little later on I'm going to tell you about a, a failure where they didn't plan for change. Medicine is not static, right? So, so you know, two years ago, who knew that measles was going to be a thing again? And, and it is. You know, 10, 15 years ago, who knew that diabetes was going to be a problem? In, in our society. Well, it is. 
And, and what that means is then, when I say software and business processes must track, this means, as a simple example, the order sets that you issue, right? So, so when you go in for your annual physical, it's not that the physician says, well, I need this and I need this and I need this. Typically, the physician will say, I need, you know, patient is a male over 65, I need this particular order set. And they'll check that. And then if you happen to have some other conditions, they may check a few others. But it's not that they go through, well, those order sets will change. And so your software must track. And the other big thing, which is actually a success factor of Vista, is in the VA, back when they were actively working with Vista, I mean, they still are, but there were a large number of small changes. It wasn't that they went, oh, now we're going to have version 1, now we're going to have version 2, now we're going to have version 3. You may have 100 small changes going in in the course of a month. And by making these changes small and incremental, you know, nobody gets the butterflies about, oops, we're installing this big thing, we, you know, what's going to be your a fallback because everything is you're taking small steps and that I think is is important a third thing is contributing to the community so this is open source and part of successful open source is you recognize that you're part of a community and you need to contribute to the community and what this means is let's say even if you're a reasonable sized hospital and you've adopted Vista, you do not have the resources to maintain all aspects of the software. You may need all aspects of the software. You don't. So what you need to do is participate in a community where your developers and developers in other institutions are collaborating to move the software forward. And this is a, a key factor in, in success. I've seen, you know, as, a, as the opposite in failures, people that said, hey, Let's just take the software. It's a, it's a free leg up to get started. Now we don't need to, to go participate. And also, and, and by the way, those links are, are some links to some online communities. And the other thing is to recognize that there is no one who's an expert in all of Vista. And again, again this is just like in healthcare. There's no one person who's an expert in, in all of healthcare. And uh, so there are people who are experts in the infrastructure. Vista has its own, for example, database management system. There are, in fact, successful implementations. I forgot to mention this a couple of slides ago. A lot of them hire what are called clinical applications coordinators. So these are people who might be nurses, who might be pharmacists, who might be laboratory technicians, who might be doctors. They understand the clinical side and they interface with the programmers and the development side, and they sort of translate because otherwise they don't. So, so they understand both sides, and they work closely together. So, so replicating that success of close relationships between the users or the clinical users and the developers is, is critical. Yeah, and this is the builds on what I said last time, which is, you know, you really need to, if it's free and open source software and you want to keep it free and open source, you have to contribute. And you can contribute in kind, or you can contribute by hiring experts and, you know, paying them. And, but ultimately, you know, even in the open source world, we have, you know, we have to put bread on the table and uh, roofs over our heads and, um, you know, we have to save for retirement and all of those things. So, so I think that, the, you know, with resp all of these things tied together, like responsible use means in participating in the community. So this is a, a key factor of success. Yes, sir. Typically, so you so you can. So the Osera, well Osera, which is one of the other organizations, has a GitHub repo. Yeah, is there one single? There's not one. There's one, not one single again. 
the it, it's sort of in some sense a little bit like the Linux desktop. It's so successful because there are so many of them. So there's there's World Vista, there's Osera Vista, and they talk all the time. So just last week there was I was at a conference where they were both there, but they essentially have separate code bases that kind of track each other, but they're not identical. Well, uh, upstream there is the foyer from the VA, okay. and and what Osera does is, in fact, they'll get the the foyer from the VA and they'll post it. And I think Wellvista also gets the foyer, but ultimately they they add things to it. So you know, Wellvista, for example, has got pediatric growth charts. Osera has done things like coming up with visualizations of relationships between routines and data and the software, and they do different things. And and that's part of. I guess acquiring expertise where if you want to do this, you should start by immersing yourself in the community, realize which one best meets your needs, and then take what you want from the other distributions. All right, have some stories of recipes of failure. And, and here, I will name names. Well, perhaps not for this first slide, but um, you know, focusing on the next cool technology is is a mistake that is made in long-lived systems. Okay, so you know, people say, okay, Bumps is old. Well, yes, Bumps is old. Unix is old. TCP/IP is old. Uh, pardon? Epic is using Bumps. And they're the largest, yeah, so, so most of us at some part of our electronic medical records are probably in an EPIC system somewhere. They're using bumps, the, the um, yeah, so it is a de facto standard in, in, in healthcare except for CERNA, which is what the Department of Defense decided to use. And CERNA uses Oracle, which is somewhat more expensive, I would say. Well, the front end of EPIC, I, you know, so again, they have many many front ends. So with any large system, you have a back. The back end might be mumps, or the back end might be whatever. But they have messaging interfaces and other interfaces by which you can create new front ends. Now, the front end that I know about is actually done in Visual Basic, and and I was actually so my dad about six years ago had open heart surgery at um, Langan Medical Center in New York. It was on a Friday, and normally after you have open heart surgery, they take you to this uh, intensive care room where if you're a family member, they bring you in for like five minutes or 10 minutes and then they hurry you out, and then an hour later they let you come in and so on. Well, this time, because it is Friday afternoon and most of the cardiac intensive care unit was empty except for three or four patients, they let my sister and me just stay inside and hang out. And I saw, so in, and in this thing they actually have a nurse sitting by the side of each patient 24-7, and they had an, and they were running Epic, and they had this nurse running this visual basic interface. And I could see that this interface was just right, you know, she would look at my dad, put something on the system. So he was literally going back and forth between my dad and the system. I'm sure they have other interfaces for, for other applications, but the back end is mumps, the front end is whatever. And, and that was six years ago, maybe they have something completely different today. Because front-end technology changes much more rapidly than back-end technology does. But for the back-end, you know, focusing on the next cool thing, I think, is a, is a problem. Medical records are long-lived. So I think, so if you look at mumps, for example, day zero is actually December 31st, 1840. Because one of the things was when it was implemented, Part of it was they wanted to make sure that there would be no human being alive who would have a negative age or a negative date of birth, and you know it was just one of those things. That and then knowledge is actually embedded in the source code, and, and this is a fact of any large application where <coughs> you can't just say I'm going to replace it because there is always knowledge in the in the source code, even if you say we're going to document it. Now, as I said, the front end technology changes. 
So I'm going to name names out here. So if you don't keep your business logic and your Vista in lockstep, you're going to have problems. So I was so one of the adoptees of Vista was the Mexican Social Security Administration. Now in Mexico, if you're an employee of a company, they pay you pay some and your employer pays some social security tax. And as part of this, you're entitled to care from the Social Security Administration. So I was at Vista meetings in 2003, and there were some people from Mexico that said, yeah, we're interested in Vista, and then we didn't hear from them for a year and a half. Then they came back at a year and a half later and said, we've implemented Vista. Wow, that's amazing. And it turns out what they had done was they'd actually gone in, they'd hired a team, so they had like, they'd implemented it at something like 60 hospitals, which is amazingly fast. So they hired this company, they hired a team, the team would go into a hospital, spend six weeks at the hospital, train the users, implement the system, and leave. So anyway, I got to visit one of the, the largest women's and children's hospital in Mexico City back in, let's say, 2006. The hospital had a capacity of 200 beds. You walk around the hospital, you know, some beds are full, some are empty. According to the Vista system, there are 600 patients in the hospital. <laughs> but you know, you walk around, you don't see multiple patients sharing a bed, you don't see patients on the floor. So the problem was that when someone was well, let's say someone came and gave birth to a baby, whatever, the, the nursing staff would say, fine, you can pack up and leave. They never went into their VISTA system to say, this patient is now discharged. So they had 600 patients according to their VISTA system. And when I visited them, they were actually planning on one weekend later that month, they were actually gonna have all employees in and they were gonna do a physical inventory of patients in the hospital so that they could go into the VISTA system and, and sort of discharge the ones who were not there anymore. So this is what you get when you don't keep your business processes and your IT in, in lockstep. <laughs> so, you know, another one is managing it like a, an office suite and talked about the Mexican Social Security Administration. Now, they did that in record time because they had a CIO at the time who told his staff, implement Vista or get fired. Okay, so that is a powerful incentive. So they implemented Vista and as I said, they had these teams that would go in six weeks. They had two teams, so they were doing three ho two hospitals every, I mean, one hospital every three weeks. They would go in in six weeks, implement Vista. They had these computer <coughs> IT rooms in each hospital with backup power supplies, and they would leave. There was no journaling to recover in the event of a system crash. There was no updating. It was basically just a fire and forget of, of a healthcare IT system. And what I told you about the Women's and Children's Hospital was just one example. Eventually, the system you know, keeled over and died because the, the employees implemented it, they left, moved on to other things, and those who were left didn't know how to maintain it, and they just had this uh, system running in the, in the back office that became less and re less relevant with time. So not investing in sustaining expertise is, is a problem. So I talked about the, the implementations that were funded by the Department of State in the 1990s, like the Egypt Cancer Institute. They never developed expertise. They went in, they implemented the system, they you know, may have done some training and, and whatnot, but ultimately, if you're using an open source system, you need to accept that this is your system, you own it, you need to have the expertise to run it. And this is what I think the Jordanians did right and the Egyptians and others did wrong. That doesn't apply just for open source. Pardon? That doesn't yeah. apply just for open source. Sure, it's not just for open source, but yeah. But but the the failure examples I have, I mean obviously these are with Vista specifically. Ignoring the ecosystem is a is another issue. So I know of at least one company, and there are others, but at least one company that just said, hey, here's this Vista system from the VA. We can take that and we can use that to start our company. 
and then we don't need to participate in the ecosystem anymore. Well, the company still has the Vista system, but eventually they ended up acquiring other things and sort of migrating to other parts of the business where now Vista is just a small part of their, of their business and it's mostly, they're not getting new customers, they're just maintaining the customers that they acquired 10 or 15 years ago. And those customers are kind of stuck with the system just as much as they'd be stuck with any other you know, system that's, that's slowly getting obsolete. So the ecosystem is important. And that brings me to the, the end of the talk. I, you know, th I thought I'd be done sooner, but you know, we do have time for discussion and, and questions. And uh, let, me, let me come down because I've got to a point now where my hearing isn't as good as it used to be. And either you need to talk very loudly or I need to come close to you. So any questions? All right, for starters, um, and you may not know this, do you know if it's CMS high tech certified? So I think back in 2007, uh -huh. there was a thing called Vista Office EHR which did get certified. Okay. And then there was a variant of that which is certified under something called meaningful use. Right, that's, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, so it, it was certified. I know Open EMR, which is based on Vista originally. No, Open EMR, no, they're unrelated. But. Oh, okay. Um, because I know that they have have spots for you to contribute back to them, um, and they do use GitHub for theirs, and um, and they are high tech certified. Okay. So, so I, I I know that at one point. And again, I was involved in that mm -hmm. many years ago. So I was actually one of the co-founders of World Vista. And then I had a you know, full-time job and I was running the organization. So I had to step down at some point because I also had kids and mm -hmm. was in Boy Scouts and whatnot. But uh, I'd be happy to connect you with um, Nancy Anthracite, who is the head of World Vista. Mm -hmm. And you can ask the question about the current status okay. of that. So the question was, has anyone from MySQL or Postgres made hooks to, to read the MOPS database? The answer is no. And there are several reasons for that. So one of them is that those are relational databases. And this is a hierarchical key value database. So they don't quite match. Okay, and then that gets to the second part of the answer, which is that because of the tight integration of the MUMPS language at the MUMPS database, which you don't get with Postgres right. and MySQL with their newer right. JSON and other architectures, is one of performance. So on a, so if you look at like the, the Jordanian system, they're running on an x86 Linux server. It's not a terribly expensive server, but it's a x86 Linux server grade machine and they're currently running something like um, 7,000 concurrent users and literally running on that machine. And no other database would be capable of running that, that machine. No, I think I heard one of your interviewers talking about the, the number of transactions yeah. that there's no yeah. comparison with SQL yeah. database, trying to mimic the SQL database. Right. In, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a completely different application, I have a, a story and here I can't name names for various reasons, but this was a banking application running on our database and then working with a, one of the big proprietary California-based database vendors. So that vendor actually worked with the company to port to their, their database. And there were, were actually a couple of customers that, that ran on it. And, and when they ran on that database, the and then later on, they switched back to the, the database that I was uh, responsible for. And the day ends went from an hour and a half to ten min under 10 minutes. So there are actually documented differences in performance. Now, I'm sure that there are other examples where 
the reverse would be true where they've done optimizations that are not in the end database. Ultimately, optimizations are all a matter of finding the, the use cases that you need to optimize and then optimizing those and then there are other use cases that you don't. So the way that I always, um, and again, this is back when I managed the other implementation, the, the pure mumps implementation rather than YaraDB. The analogy I would always use is that the, the big relational databases, that's like a minivan. And a minivan is something for taking the kids to a soccer game, taking a vacation across the country, commuting to work. It's like a general purpose solution. Whereas the, the mumps database is more like a, a truck, right? So if you need to move a lot of goods from point A to point B, you would use that. But you certainly wouldn't take the kids to a football game in a truck, other than perhaps on Halloween. <laughs> so it, it, it's, a, it's something completely different. So you can't quite compare the two. And I do know of, so there was a, an Israeli company that developed a, Mumps to Java translator, and they translated the, the application to Java. And what was, let's say, 100 and some megabytes of source code became something like several gigabytes of source code working against a, a, a brand name relational database. And it basically tanked, it, it couldn't run. And there are also examples when the Department of Defense tried replacing one of their systems. And so anyway, it's all a question of having the right tool for the job. So when MUMPS was written back in whenever they were written, PT 11 or so, there were 64 K individual mesh and then they had levels of more advanced. Actually, PDP 7, PDP oh, 7. Really? Yeah. I, I, I have another whole talk on the history of that, which <laughs> I, I, I gave last year and I can you know give it again. Maybe if you if you come for the after dinner party with a with a beer with a beer in my hand, I can give that talk again. <laughs> Wasn't it PDP seven also in Unix? What? PDP seven was for Unix. Right? Yeah, exactly. Unix started in PDP seven. So all these incremental improvements and say they're adding in new data sources and stuff like that. Is that all done in M? Like the programmers that work, you know, on these systems are programming in M mostly. So the back end is pretty much all programmed in M, and, and to this day. And, and part of the challenge there is, you know, there are some modules which are written originally in the 1980s, yeah. and the standards of the code may not quite be what they are today. So you really have to, to learn to, to code with that standard or to update the module. Or, you know, that's common to any large software system. You use FileMan? Yeah, have you? I mean, do you? Yeah, that's the biggest problem with VA system is that a lot of their systems get access through FileMan. Well, fi FileMan is the database management system under within Vista. Okay, but they also use it for doing reports and access. Like, at the VA hospital, all their work orders are scheduled using FileMan. It's all aligned with it. Yeah. And they don't give them the tools. They they give them a very old, now this may have changed because it's a couple of years ago. They give them a very old, out of date version of, um, uh, what's the name? One of the old emulators on Windows. The Thermal emulator, Tom, 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 something. Okay. And they would give them that and they would log on to that. They would open up under the covers an SSH sandwich thing to something. But they never knew they were doing it. And this thing was very limited in what you could do. You, you couldn't save things off and then import them. Okay. So they have to 